infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's podcast. Now, the University of Michigan Health blog recently reported on a acanthamoeba case in a Lansing, Michigan woman. She was initially diagnosed as having pink eye. However, things got worse, and after going to six doctors, she was referred to the University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center, where she was ultimately diagnosed with the parasitic infection. Well, joining me today to talk about acanthamoeba is Shazad Mian, MD. Dr. Mian is a professor of ophthalmology at Michigan Medicine. Dr. Mian, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. Um, so before we get into the specific case, let's talk a little bit about the parasite acanthamoeba. What is it and how does somebody typically contract this? That's a great question. So acanthamoeba is a single-cell organism uh, which lives in water and soil, and it's really all around us. So uh, it is uh, commonly present in our environment, uh, but most of us are not impacted by acanthamoeba unless uh, we have uh, some breakdown in our uh, ability to protect ourselves. So uh, the setting that we're talking about here is an infection in the eye, specifically in the cornea, which is the front clear portion of the eye. And uh, it is likely to occur in people who ha wear contact lenses and are exposed to the parasite through usually poor contact lens hygiene. Okay. And what is the typical pathology that we see with acanthamoeba? So the most common way it affects the eye is that it causes an infection in the cornea leading to uh, early, in the early stages, pain and light sensitivity and irritation in the eye, which may present itself as just a red eye. Uh, again, it is most commonly associated with people who actually wear contact lenses. Uh, and so somebody who wears contact lenses can present with a red eye or a conjunctivitis, uh, but they may, uh, they likely have an infection invo involving their cornea called keratitis. So the fact that she was initially diagnosed with pink eye, that doesn't surprise you? No, it doesn't. In fact, that's the most common way uh, it presents because uh, from a uh, contact lens user perspective, a patient perspective, that's what you see when you look in the mirror. Your eyes are red or irritated and they're light sensitive, which can happen uh, due to many uh, conditions. And uh, canthamoeba is a rare cause of that happening, but that's usually how it presents. Yeah. Um, and let's go ahead and move to the case of the um, patient uh, that I described in the intro. Um, do we know how she contracted it? So she was a, our patient here was a contact lens wearer and she did not uh, keep good contact lens hygiene. She had a history of uh, swimming in a freshwater body, uh, either in a lake or river, uh, with her contact lenses in, uh, and also did not take great care of her contact lens in terms of cleaning them. And those are typical um, things of how usually uh, people present with uh, uh, this type of infection. Now, of course, a lot of times by the time we're making the diagnosis, unfortunately, there's a delay in the diagnosis. Of this is often many weeks later, so this is in hindsight people are remembering that they may have been doing things that may have increased their risk. Sure, and this is exactly the case for this for this patient. Um, it was a period of time, you know, since she was. Uh, diagnosed with pink eye until she arrived at Michigan Health. How did she present when she uh, finally got to you guys? So for uh, by the time she came to see us, she had already had this um, uh, diagnosis of an infection in her eye, but it was unclear what the cause was. And um, the presentation uh, included her having a lot of significant pain and uh, significant decrease in her vision by then, and the infection definitely involved uh, her cornea. Uh, so we were able to diagnose her by not just her clinical presentation of the history she was presenting with, uh, her clinical exam where the 
signs were suggestive of the cantamoeba infection, but we were also able to culture for it, which really helps us make the correct diagnosis. Right. That really led into another question I had. Um, what is the definitive laboratory test for that? So there are, um, we can culture for the infection. So there are multiple ways to make the diagnosis, the most common ways that we culture. And you can do culturing by routinely growing the parasite in special media. Uh, but there's also a way of more advanced uh, assessment through PCR testing. Um, and we can also look for the infection with highly specialized imaging tools that we have now in the um, uh, office as well. So these are tools that allow us to actually visualize the cornea at a cellular level so we can look for this tiny organism in the cornea just by taking a picture of the patient's eye. Um, and so that further helps us make the diagnosis. Now it's all not always possible to use the imaging tools, so we usually use uh, the culturing techniques because they're more definitive. Sure. Now is this commonly mix misdiagnosed in the very early stages, I imagine, right? Unfortunately, it is because the presentation is relatively generic and unless you're looking for a serious cause for the presentation, then you may miss it. So often, patients will present, again, with a history of a conjunctivitis or a pink eye. Uh, they may even have a corneal infection that initially is thought to be bacterial, uh, but if it's not getting better, it may be reported out as it's caused by a virus. Uh, and they get treated with a virus for a few weeks. And unfortunately, that's often when it gets diagnosed, when it's not getting better with other treatment modalities. So, I mean, essentially any ophthalmologist should be able to diagnose this, right? I mean, it doesn't take a, requ uh, special, a specialty ophthalmologist. No, any ophthalmologist can diagnose it, but I think that's where um, a good history of knowing if the patient has increased risk factors becomes an important part of that decision making. Yeah. Now, she harbored the amoeba for quite a lengthy time. Um, how was she treated? So the treatment for the canthamoeba is with topical eye drops and sometimes oral medications as well. So these are specifically to kill the parasite. Now, as I mentioned, this is a parasite is present in water and is readily available, uh, readily surrounding us. Uh, so often one of the treatments for this is using disinfectants, which are actually used as pool cleaners as an eye drop. So we, there's a diluted form of the pool cleaner that we use in this eye drop to attack or kill the cysts that are causing the infection, in addition to other uh, topical antibiotics. Right, and if, and if the infection goes far enough, it requires transplant. Unfortunately, if the infection cannot be controlled medically, then it requires replacing the cornea or doing a corneal transplant. And now that may be needed even if the infection has been fully treated because this type of infection can result in scar tissue formation in the cornea, which has a significant impact on the vision. Uh, and therefore, in order to help improve the patient's vision, uh, we uh, may need to do a corneal transplant as well. Uh, can you discuss how she's doing today? Uh, she's doing very well at this point. Fortunately, she has undergone her uh, infection treatment. It stabilized, meaning that it was fully controlled with medications, but she was left with scar tissue. And then so we went back and did a corneal transplant to help improve her vision. And uh, although she's relatively early in the course of her uh, follow-up care, uh, she's doing very well with her vision improvement. Oh, great news. And let's go ahead and close out the, the podcast with this question. Uh, Dr. Mian, can you uh, provide for the audience some tip, um, tips on prevention of acanthamoeba? I think that's actually the most important thing to talk about today is prevention because this is such a serious infection, can lead to such uh, disability uh, and is debilitating with respect to vision loss and besides all the discomfort and pain patients go through, uh, that prevention is key. Uh, who is at risk? Well, uh, the number one risk factor here uh, is use of contact lenses. Now, we know we have you know, roughly about 30 million contact lens users in the U.S., so that's quite common, but most people don't get this infection. Their rate is about 1 in 2 million or so. So uh, who is at increased risk uh, within contact lens wearing patients? It's people who don't um, clean their contact lens properly, so contact lens hygiene is critical to reducing the risk. What does that mean? It means that you are replacing your contact lens solutions regularly, replacing the case you store them regularly, and most importantly, cleaning them thoroughly. Um, and for soft contact lens users, it's using the proper multi-purpose solutions. 
Uh, for hard contact lens users, uh, it's using, again, the proper solutions uh, to clean the lenses every time they use them. And even simpler things to remember is making sure that for the contact lenses that are stored, that you wash your hands properly before you touch the contact lens and store it in the solution. So all those little things really add up to help reduce the risk. Additional risk factors specifically for canthamoeba, again, as I mentioned earlier, are patients who are exposed to um, water that's not clean and that's contaminated, which is, again, fresh water. So if you go swimming in a lake or a river and that's coming up now as our weather turns here in Michigan, uh, it is a really important either to not wear your contact lenses, but if you're wearing them, to make sure that you're really cleaning them thoroughly before reusing them. Oh, great advice. And I imagine tap water is out of the question. Absolutely. And that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. That um, one of the mistakes that people make is that they store their contact lenses temporarily uh, in tap water. And you should never, ever do that because tap water has these cysts. And you're basically uh, soaking the lens in a fluid, which has the infection-causing organism. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Mian, for sharing your time and your expertise with the audience. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for sharing this with everybody.